So um, I thought that for this um, for this particular meeting, uh, if it's okay with you two, um, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing a little bit about um, what uh, what you had told me on the phone was, you know, being gone three Sundays in a row, that, that took its toll. And I believe that. I absolutely believe that. Um, because it, it, it weakens us, e even just anybody who had, you know, who just lives a normal life without any kind of addictions or anything like that, not being around their church family, things like that, it weakens people. And so, uh, but I thought maybe I would um, maybe give one or both of you the opportunity to just sort of share uh, a little bit of your experience and then maybe share a little bit of some things that you learned uh, while you were in rehab. So any either one of you that wants to take over, I'm perfectly um, fine. I've said for a long time, you know, if I miss three services, I'm, I'm, I'm using, you know, that's just when the Word of God leaves, the devils creep in, and uh, that's how it happened. You know, it started off with just a relapse a couple months ago, and then with the corona, and uh, not missing the, and then missing the services, and not having the accountability, and the church family mm -hmm. um, just weighed on me to where we started using, and then started using daily, and then but God was there with me the whole time even though I was running from him he was I believe that and um, when I started seeing when me and Pam started arguing and seeing our relationship start to fall mm -hmm. we knew it was time to get some help and I figured the best way to help at that time was to get away from it and go to rehab so that way we could know that we would get the clean time we needed to get our head back on our shoulders mm -hmm. and uh, here are some things that we wanted to hear um, I thought I was going to go to a Christian track program and what I ended up in was far from that as probably as secular as you can get um, there was probably two three people that said they were saved and um, I'm not anybody's judge but I doubt there was that many probably um, probably not yeah you're right so through that whole time, I thought, well, was God punishing me or something like that? And I don't, I don't feel as if he was punishing me, but he was letting me choose my own free will. Um, since I was on the drugs, he, it, was more, it was more like, if you want the world, I'll show you the world. And, and it did. And it showed me what, you know, life would be in the world with, you know, with, uh, without him that's a good that's good I'm going to talk about that in a minute and Keep going. Uh, so I was dealing with my own kind of struggles of course when you know you're coming off drugs your mind's a hundred different places and everything like that and the one thing I couldn't really cope with was not being what God led me to do and leave my family and uh, um just that little bit of control, you know, I felt really bad that I wasn't able to be there for kid and my, the kids and Pam. Um, but that's just what I had to, you know, suffer through there. Um, then uh, in classes, there was a spirit, uh, meditation and spiritual class. There you go. And um, it was far from any kind of spiritual, which I see in the Bible. It was... Um, uh, the meditation they wanted to do, breathing, you know, exercises, and I get that to a point. But when you start using hand signals and counting and and uh, ritual type stuff, it, it was a little too much, and I have I had to excuse myself a couple times through that. And um, I was asked afterwards why I why I exited the room. And I said uh, that that goes too far. That's that's witchcraft and. And to me, and that went over well, didn't it? Um, when you said witchcraft, no, yeah. actually, um, the next class that was the spiritual meditation, 
they were kind of making fun of me because they were saying, hey, it's witch class craft, you know, or, or witch class uh, yeah. time, and, you know, and... Um, it, 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 I, I hate to interrupt you, but fine. to me, the irony of here these, and and I'm assuming it wasn't any of the 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 group leaders that said that. No. It was no. the people. Oh, yeah. But apparently these people haven't learned the value of we're supposed to be in this together, not poking fun at one another over one another's beliefs. Yeah. So I guess the belief system, whatever belief you have is okay as long as you're not a born-again Christian. Yeah. And if you're born again a Christian, then you're fair game as far as they're concerned. They yeah. didn't care about yeah. you and how you would re respond to that as far as sobriety. They just tried to tear you up. And the the class leader, he, he understood. He uh, once you you know found out why I left, he was fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, that's not you know it's probably not in his beliefs, but that was what he shared was that's what worked for him. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, I think it just opens doors for. The wrong kind of people, and I mean the wrong kind of spirits, and you got to watch that because even the bad spirits will do good things for you sometimes, and it just leads you into a trap a lot of times. It's a good point, but um, some of the other things I, I just I felt God put me in that situation and led me through that, so I would come back to Him on His terms. Um, it it would have been easy to been in fellowship with Christians. And kind of write a church pew, you know. It yeah. would have been easy for that, but uh, I think he was really working on me to uh, do my own program and um, you know do my own spiritual walk through mm -hmm. through the reconciliation with him. Right. Um, to the whole time, I, I never lost hope. He was always there to comfort me, and um, and uh, just it wasn't. In times past, when I, when the first relapse, I really felt the God's whooping on that one. That one, that one, I felt the whooping, and on this one, um, it was, it, it wasn't like that. It was a lot more comforting, and uh, more like he just, you know, like this was his plan, you know, in some way or another. If you look at every one of those verses that I have there, mm -hmm. the key word tonight is comfort. Yeah, and, and, and I was those. comforted, and yeah. even in this trialing time. I mean, and uh, but it was it was great, and, and um, I take a lot of good from it. That now me and Pam are on the right path. Amen. Together, and I think now we can do God's will better than we could before. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I don't I don't think anybody needs to go through a, a relapse or or do drugs or alcohol or any kind of sin to to get to a good place but um if you are there i think god can you know god can still use you in any situation that you're in absolutely he can absolutely can i'm glad you said it that way um you had said something to me uh last night um i think it was after the service maybe about what was what was really in your heart through all of this? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what you said? Um, that God is using us to help people, like our situation, to um, maybe comfort people and um, that are that are in the same boat that we were in. <laughs> that that's the exact verse that I have right at the top of the page too. So. I, yeah, I just had an idea. Maybe I should talk about comfort. And actually, what I had put together was based upon what you said to me last night. And the way you said it today was actually better than what you said last night. And it actually matches that first place there. And I'll get into those verses in a minute. But uh, I was writing some things down. I didn't, I didn't want to interrupt you too much. Uh, to, so you could just let your thoughts just kind of come out and say what you wanted to say. But in um, the, the first thing that I took note of what you were talking about was a, a word that you see often in the Bible. It's, and it's a word we don't 
use a lot, so we don't really understand the meaning of it, but it's the word vexation. And I said it like this the other day. If, if I knew that you didn't like fingers on a chalkboard. Now, me personally, I can scratch a chalkboard all day long, and it does not bother me. Okay, But if I knew, if I was trying to really get at you, and I knew that by me scratching the chalkboard just really turned you into to Mr. Hyde, um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to scratch on that chalkboard, and you're going to have a reaction to it. Okay, now the first maybe a minute or so, you're going to try to fight off that reaction and fight off what it's what it's trying to do to you. Okay, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep scratching that chalkboard because I want I want a reaction out of you. Okay, or like a guy pushing you. Okay? If a guy pushes you, comes by and shoves you once. You'll bristle up, okay? But, you know, you're going, okay, I'm not going to jail for this guy, or I'm not going to, you know, whatever. But if he pushes you again, it becomes a little bit more difficult to ignore that push. If he pushes you a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time, at what point do you stop and say, I have had enough of you pushing me around. I've had it, okay? And that's really what vexation is. It is a tool that the devil uses. Uh, we know, we read in, in Jude, where, and Second Peter 2, they're, they're mirror, almost mirror images, or actually like twins, identical twins. Jude and 2 Peter 2, where they they talk about just Lot. Lot, who is justified, so we know he's in heaven. We know that whatever God saw in Lot was, he wasn't like the other people living in Sodom. So we know that, and God was going to spare him. But in the, in the Old Testament story of Lot, Genesis um well, it starts in Genesis 13 is when Lot chose to go to Sodom. And at first he chooses the, the well-watered plains of Sodom to live outside of Sodom. But next time we see him, Genesis 19, he's living right inside Sodom. And he is seeing what's going on every day. So the Bible, so Jude said, um, just Lot vexed with the transgressions of the wicked. From day to day, he's got to see this stuff going on, and it's getting him. It's really tearing a hole in him, and that's what it's supposed to do. So um, when the devil wants to knock us down, he will vex us. He will use whatever tool he uses in the past to scratch that chalkboard, to shove us and when we don't give in instantly he's ready for that because he's not going to stop he's going to keep doing it now one of the things that i like about our bible is it teaches us that the devil is he's very intelligent but he's not human intelligent okay turkey turkey's smartest animal in the woods got a brain that big okay but it can't add two plus two, okay? So humans can, and but the devil cannot. He when when in Genesis nine when God put it in the beasts of the earth to have a fear of man, you take that same idea and apply it to Christ and all the devils of the universe, because they're all beasts, and so Jesus said. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay? So, anytime you actively resist the vexations of the devil, it's, it's good to keep in mind that at some point, he's not going to prevail over you if you don't allow him to. 
Um, eventually, anybody who withstands him and stands against him, he has to leave because who's standing there with you? Jesus. Jesus. And he sees it. He sees a great big, you know, 400 foot tall Jesus standing next to you. And he's afraid of that. Now, did the devil spend some time with Jesus in the Bible? Yes, he tried. He tried for a while to get him to sin. But when Jesus flat out refused and gave him scripture, what did he do? He fled. He left him for a season. He comes back, though. So one of the things that, um, you know, that led up to, you know, what's going on with, with you guys was the vexation part. It's like a, the perfect storm. It's a combination of, number one, maybe things going on at home. Number two, maybe things going on at work. Number three, the COVID thing, the ridiculous COVID thing, where they made perfectly sick people act like we all had the flu, shut the churches down. And um, so that hurt probably a lot more people and probably still is because their places in this country right now is still illegal, according to their governor, to go to church. Have more than 10 people in the building. One thing on that, as I read on on Facebook today that the uh, drug enforcement agency put out a thing that says a lot of people are struggling at this time and help numbers for that. And I heard two things on the radio about the same thing mm -hmm. that, that in this time a lot of people are struggling oh i believe and, it and they're sending out help you know putting out numbers for helplines because of this you took people's jobs away from them yeah. you took their churches their and you know even if some churches ain't really all that good at being churches people still had they had friends there had family there they had a support system yeah, there yeah. that was all taken away and gave us all a great amount of idle time Egg, exactly, and that yeah, I was going to say that the, the idle mind is the devil's workshop. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And then they gave him a paycheck to go. <laughs> yeah, here's free money. Oh, I was watching. They canceled my Life PD, which I'm still ticked off of. They, they Life PD. As soon as the check started going out in uh, South Carolina, they they caught this guy. He was on a motor scooter. And it was stolen. So he ran. They finally chased him down. And they said, you got anything in your pockets? He said, yeah. He had a pocket full of drugs. He said, and he said, I just got my check, <laughs> my stimulus check. So I was going to party this weekend. He had just got the check cash, was going to buy it, and, and went out and bought drugs. So anyway, it, that, that was a setup in more of the ways than one. We can talk about the political part. We won't. But it was a setup. And... Actually, in Ezekiel 16, the God lists the three sins of Sodom. Okay, and it wasn't the homosexual act at all. It was um, pride, fullness of bread, and an abundance of idleness. That was the sin of Sodom. They had plenty to eat, so they didn't need to work. And then because they didn't need to work, they just sat around all day. When you sit around all day, the devil works on you to get your mind on his vexation, what he's doing to tempt you, to get you into that. And so any, any program that you go to, if they're going to be smart about this, they're going to tell you, find something to occupy your mind. Find something to do to get your mind off of sitting wondering where you can get drugs or where you can buy this or where you can, what you can do with this and so on. So the, the vexation is the weakening of our defenses. After a while, you get tired of being pushed. You get tired of the fingernails on the chalkboard. I can't take it anymore. And the devil says, fine, call this guy. And I'll, I'll quit. And it, it happens. It works. Okay. So again, um, the second thing that I'm going to, that I'm going to bring up, um, the, the blessing that I got 
when you called me and told me what had happened. Now, back years ago, it was sort of an unwritten rule that if you went to church, you never did anything wrong. Okay? And so for people to actually call their pastor and confess something that they had done never happened. People just didn't do that. Number one, people didn't think that way. Number two, probably most pastors will say, well, that we can't have people like you in our church and so on. But this is a different time. It's a different world. And sin is sin and life is real. And the scriptures actually, it actually gives us the, um, the rules on how to deal with it. And I remember I've always said, if you abide under authority, then you abide under the protection of that authority. Okay. So the authority of the word of God, it gives us these things that as Bible believers, there's, there are things we're not supposed to do. It's called sin. Okay. But who among us has never sinned, even since we become church members? All of us have. Okay. So then God, Jesus initiated a rule and gave it to us. And he said, uh, if any of you are overtaken in a sin or brother, if you have a brother who's overtaken a sin, you go to them. Okay. Just you and him. When Jesus and John three sat down with Nicodemus, who else was in the room? It was Jesus and Nicodemus. And that was it. And so the idea is that once that sin is confessed and repented of, it is forgiven at that exact point. It's forgiven and it's done. It's over with. There, there is nobody in the church has a right to know it. Nobody in the church, it doesn't, we don't have to have a meeting about this. Um, we don't have a registry anywhere that keeps track of people's sins. Nothing. Once confession is made of a transgression, even among church people, it's, uh, it's over with. It's done. There is no, there's no punishment. There's no consequences. We don't ban you from the church for 30 days. We don't do anything like that. It's over with because the object with Jesus was always about restoration. And then Paul doubled down on that. He says in Galatians, you know, you bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Brethren, if, any, if anyone be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be like unto him. So the idea is, well, of course somebody in our church sinned. I have. Okay, it, it ain't right. We don't, and we're not excusing it in any way. And I, I guarantee you, God's dealt with everybody sitting at this table. Uh, but that's the thing; it's God doing it. It's not some angry church member. And I've heard stories like you wouldn't believe. Somebody finds out somebody in the church did something. Well, the pastor knew about it. All of a sudden, now people in the church want to have a meeting and vote that person out because they did something. And Pastor says, uh, excuse me, that's not how it goes. There are rules here. And so the issue of a, of a someone and you guys had just joined the church not too long ago. Okay. And now think about that for a minute. Think about the devil working on both of you saying, oh, you joined Bethel. Well, maybe I've got something to say about that. It's been that way. I believe that. It's been that way. I believe that the idea that, you know, and maybe I'm speaking for you, but man, we let them down, you know, they're probably going to throw us out or whatever. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not kidding you. We were given a rule book to follow. And we, in our church, we all had the same exact same rule book with the exact same words in it. And those rules are meant number one, to limit what we do, but also protect us. It's just like if, 
if you would have got caught by the police, you're going to need a defense lawyer. Okay? Well, guess who that is? Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the, we have an advocate with the Father. Advocate is a legal term. It literally means a lawyer who stands in court in our place and says, my, my Lord, he is not guilty. Okay? I paid the debt. I took care of it. It's all over with. It's done. There's no d double jeopardy in the law. And there's no double jeopardy with God either. He can't bring it back up ever. And so that's the benefit and the blessings of having the Bible as an authority over our lives is that if we will abide under that authority, then I don't know that you actually sat and thought all this out, what I'm saying to you now, before you called me. But I absolutely believe the Holy Ghost told you, call Brother Mike, call Brother Mike, let him know what happened. And did I jump down your throat? No. I didn't. You were there. You're my biggest supporter and help and encouragement. And will always be. Will always be. I've, I'm not going to sit here and give you a list of sins that I know people in our church have committed. But I know they have been. And I'm telling you, anybody, anybody that has ever had a humble attitude about things they do wrong, I'm the first one to be on their side. The first one. And you've you've heard me preach enough. Let's have a church where we can be honest, where we can be our where we can be us. I don't want a church full of people who are fake and phonies and who pretend that they never do anything wrong. I refuse to have that church. So that's why I, I gave you permission a long time ago. Yeah. Anytime you talk about alcohol, yeah, bingo. Yep. Royal. He'll hear me out there. He'll be sitting out in the foyer. And when he hears me say his name, he'll wake up and go, Hey, Brother Mike's talking about me. I need to go find out what he's saying. I like I like, like picking on you. Anyway, uh, but it, that's, that's the blessing of the, the benefit of God's laws, God's rules. We put ourselves under the authority of that. Now we're covered in that protection. There ain't, a, there ain't a, nobody in this church going to run you guys out for that. Nobody is. No. Um, you said something that, and I wrote it down, God, if you ask the question, why did this, why did God allow this to happen? Why did God let me get into that? I just preached this a couple weeks ago on the, um, the revelation of apostasy is, is the title of the sermon, but God says it, that's one thing. Then when God shows it, then we go, ah. And how many times in the Bible do you see God saying, and then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Okay? So it's like he's told him that. That's his official title even among the Jews. Okay? He, he has everybody, Jew and Gentile both, has a copy of the Ten Commandments, okay? And the things that God said he'll do to those who break those commandments. But then God's got to let it go long enough so he reacts to our sin. And then he says, now, did I not tell you that that's exactly what I was going to do to you if you did this again? And we go, yeah, you told me that. Was I lying? No, God, you were not lying. So that's why. And in the that sermon I preached a couple of weeks ago, the revelation of apostasy, what God waits for is for the rotten fruit to manifest. Because then when we see just, you said it, I'll show you how evil, evil is. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to show you how bad this stuff is and what it does. When God had Israel camped out at the banks of the Red Sea, Israel didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know that God had went and got Pharaoh, drug him over there. Now, it, what Israel sees is the Red Sea and Pharaoh and no way out. They don't know what God's going to do, 
but God knows what he's going to do. And they're afraid that Pharaoh's going to pop through any second now and kill every one of them. But they don't know that God is acting. Even though God brought Pharaoh over there, he's not letting him go past the pillar of fire. So God is even restraining Pharaoh, but he's using Pharaoh to force Israel to trust him. And that worked. Because then when God opened up the Red Sea, does anybody have to tell them that's the way you need to go? No, they're going to go. Okay, And I like, this is what I like. When Paul said, now thanks be to God, which always calls us to triumph. Now, he said in that verse that God always causes us to triumph. Okay, now, but you guys took drugs. That's not a victory. God says it is. God says it is. Here's what God was doing was he's using that to conquer an aspect of your will. A weak aspect of your will. He's using that to conquer something in you that drives us, compels us to go do some of the things we do. Okay, That's what he's doing. When you understand that plan, you're going, okay, so God isn't going to throw me in the lake of fire burning with brimstone for all of eternity. Am I still saved? Yes. Okay. Um, but God has a plan. John 15 tells us that, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And there are certain times that God is going to purge us so that we bring forth more fruit. Okay, so was this a purging for you guys oh, yeah. Yeah. individually, but also together. together? Absolutely. At one point, I was like, you know, like Israel out in the wilderness. I was like, did you bring me out here just to, you know, <laughs> leave me in the world? You know, I mean, I was felt in the world, but I, I didn't feel that way. I felt his comfort, so I knew he had a plan. I might, I didn't see it at the time. But then when I um, uh, picked up Pam and everything and in the next couple of days, how he worked in our lives and the uh, kind of things we set up afterwards, then I thought, then I seen all, you know, the, some of the fruits of what he was doing. Yeah. And um, that was really comforting. Amen. So, and then I kind of seen more of what the plan and, and the goodness that came out of this, you know. Did you have any of the New Age stuff? You guys went to two different centers, two different treatment facilities. Did you see the New Age stuff that he saw at yours? Like, the, uh, the meditation, yeah. doing yeah. Om. It was, it, there was no counting or hand movements. Your breath, come back to your breath. If you feel like you're um, going to react, find your breath and calm down. As a calming... Yeah. Okay. It's not. Um, uh, breathing's one thing. It may be a little bit iffy, but um, my experience, um, I, I, there was actually two guys that worked with the groups um, where I went, and one of them just happened to be a Bible seminary graduate, Bible college seminary student graduate. So he and I had a lot in common and and I th was very thankful for that because he knew then what I would believe in and he never never you know uh, tried to get me to do some kind of meditation or yoga or nothing like that but there was an older guy there that I didn't like him because I figured he's a flake okay and I was right and when the main guy would be doing another session with somebody, then I would end up with the other guy. And I just had it figured at some point, man, this guy's going to butt heads. Um, the guy handled it in the typical liberal tolerant way. Well, that's nice, you know, but you can see his condescending tone. But anyway, they, so he had our group doing, you know, okay, now everybody close your eyes and everybody's supposed to visualize something. Well, that's guided imagery. Okay. They do it in schools. And so they're, you know, he's leading everybody in this. 
So I get my phone out and I'm, I know I'm reading scripture. He thinks I just got my phone out. And so he wants to kind of get on to me. But I, I showed him, I said, I don't meditate that way. What I do is I think on these things. I think on these scriptures that help me. Well, that's very nice too. You know, kind of that condescending, yeah. you know, new agey tone. And um, I would like to scratch his chalkboard for a while. But anyway. That's one of the things I would do while they were, you know, doing some of the meditating and stuff. It just, I would just sit there and I would bring, yeah. you know. And what you told me, um, we we visited a little bit while you were there. And you had said, you know, I wanted a Christian facility or something, something more Christian. But it, I can see now why God didn't have me there. Because it's not everybody else's responsibility for me to, to handle my relationship with Jesus Christ. It is mine. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so that was a good, that was a good thing that you awakened to was you're not going to be in some Christian welfare program where they do everything for you. You're going to do this on your own. God's, and God's training you. Okay. You sinned. Okay. But it's just like training a the military. They take them through scenarios that are similar to a real life battle scenario, only without being killed in it. Okay. And they, take them through that to train them what to do when it comes time when the real bullets are flying in your direction here's what you do and that's what he's doing that's what he did with you guys he's done it with me he's done it with Roy he's done it he trains us in these scenarios so that when the real deadly situation comes we know how to fight this and then you're going to teach that to your kids okay I gotta move on, but um, let's see here. I can't read my own writing here. Um, oh, you said sometimes bad spirits do good things. That's true. That's true. For a little bit. For a little while. For a little while. And you know that's why the Bible goes into all the details that it does to warn us about what's a false prophet, what to look for with false prophets, how to discern spirits. What are bad spirits? What are good spirits? It, I mean, it goes into all this. I mean, very. There's a lot in the Bible to learn about bad spirits and good spirits because a lot of people get deceived. It's easy to get deceived, people, and it happens all the time. These spirits can act very benevolent. Um, I um, got this new book by Whitley Strieber. He's the guy that wrote communion about the aliens come snatching him out of his bed at night. And he's got a new book now called New World. And he says, they're out there and they are just dying to help us. They're just dying to bring us to a new age and a new world and solve all these problems that we got going on in the world. Yeah. Tom DeLonge is in on it too. These yeah. guys are saying, come down and fix our problems. So those are evil angels that those guys are convinced are are going to be the savior gods of planet Earth. But it's a show. It's a put on. Um, God had you there. We talked about that. The idea of not losing hope. If you lose hope, you just, you just might as well. Okay? Don't ever lose hope. Hope is not wishing. Hope is the understanding that if God says it in his word, he keeps it. Doesn't matter. And does it ever, is it ever based on anything that we do? I taught last night about the rewards of heaven. To me, there's one great big giant reward and it's called heaven. And who does it go to? It goes to the people who believe what he said. And in this group here, is there anybody who doubts one word in the Bible? No. So in that sense, all of us are going to get the same reward because we believe the exact same thing. And it's hope. Hope will keep us going when we don't have anything else to keep us going. There was 
one of the main uh, guys there. He kind of <clears throat> overseen everything, and he would come in and do this. He'd sit in front of you and be your addiction. Okay. He would let you, you know, talk back and forth to him, and he would. That's pretty neat. He would be, you know, your addiction. And so, I didn't get a chance to be to do that in that class, and then right after that, he had an intestinal problem. He went to the hospital. Mm. But I wanted to, I wanted to do that, and I wanted, you know, kind of show everybody and what, you know, I was thinking on what I would say, you know, when some of the things he would say, and you know, um, our addiction does get our flesh a lot of times, mm -hmm. probably always will. But he, you know, the addiction can't take your soul. No. Yeah, so See, right, right before Bonnie uh, went to the hospital, no, she had that brain tumor. Yeah. Her, her mind, well, she hit me right in the guts. She grew up uh, drinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, she really got, I turned around, I got in the car. I was heading up here to 66 station. Why I didn't make the right hand turn go down to BP, I yeah. don't know. I'll show you drinking. Yeah. I got to the hospital parking lot. I pulled in there. I sat there for a good half hour, 45 minutes. I finally got on the phone. So long time, I got to hold my buddy up and be pairs. Yep. I was that close, throwing 30 years away. Yeah, well, it'll always be there. It'll always, always yeah. have the flesh, you know. There's, if there's a button to push, the devil will push it, and there will always be a button to push and, people. And she don't, don't even know. No. Yeah. And today was a six month mark. And she's been in there. Yeah. Oh, bless her heart. Yeah. Um, the thing that that Pam brought up uh, about. God using us. You know, I've, I've been through this before at different times in my life. Okay, God, you got my attention. Um, but will you still use me? Will, am I still worth something? If we don't feel like we're worth anything, even to God, then there is, there is nothing to live for. But remember how God has the very hairs of our head numbered. And if you look all through the Bible, I would ask you to point to me, with the exception of Jesus, the perfect example of a perfect person. There is none. Not one. So God took these horrible people and he use them for his kingdom and his glory to show this is who I am. This is how I do it. With the, again, with the exception of Christ. Christ had a job that none of us will ever have, and that is dying for the entire world as a sinless sacrifice. So Christ did that, but then God calls us to do everything else in his kingdom. And um, Second Corinthians, the scriptures there that I have you... It's, uh, I love this because the word comfort is in our Bible 66 times exactly. I love that, okay? But I, I included words like comforted, you know, comforting, things like that. But look at 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort who comforteth us in how much of our tribulation? All of our tribulation. 100% of our tribulation, he comforts us. means that he gives us his Holy Spirit and he gives us of his word. That we may be, that here's the, por here's the purpose of it. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any what? Trouble. trouble. Were you in trouble? Yeah. You better believe you were. Okay? which were in any trouble. And here again, he doesn't specify, it. well, not that trouble. We can't have that. Mm -hmm. He said any trouble. By the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ 
abound in us. Christ didn't come down here and live this life of lavish luxury and then had somebody die in his place. He did it for us. He suffered, he bled, he died for us. That And so as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. You remember on game shows they used to give a consolation prize? What was that for? To the losers. <laughs> right? Okay. You didn't win the $10,000. Okay? But it was right there. You made a stupid joy. You chose door number one. It was door number two, you idiot. Here's your coffee maker. Yeah, here's your coffee maker. <laughs> isotoner gloves. Yeah, here's your isotoner gloves. Okay? That's a consolation prize. That's just, So do you don't feel bad for getting out of there and not winning anything. But with Christ, it's he consoles us. He says to us, I forgive you. It's okay. It's over with. And when I forgive you, it's over forever. Other people might bring it up. I'll never bring it up again. So, verse, um, verse 6, And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. So the the point of this, and, and again, I, I did what you did. I sat at this table full of these smelly, dirty drug addicts and alcoholics and who there was not enough smoke breaks for all of them. Okay, They all wanted more smoke breaks. And I'm sitting there, Mr. Conservative, fundamentalist Christian guy, and God's saying, Mike, now, you've been through this before. If you will relax and listen to these people, that's why I have you here. You know, I would say, you know, in the meetings, pain's my trigger. When my back is killing me, I want to be out of pain. And pain is vexation. You can only take pain for so long and then you can't take it anymore. And I learned sitting at that table that there are different types of pain. And people will smother them in alcohol, smother them in heroin, smother them in whatever. And now that the heroin's laced with so much fentanyl, and people knowing that, they don't care. Because what are they going to live for? They've already they've already ruined their whole life, and they've gone a day without taking heroin to see if they could do it. And they said, "I can't do it. I would rather die than to live without this drug." That's what they tell themselves. So, to them, you could tell them all day long. Look. The heroin's out on the street now. came from China. China's trying to kill everybody here. It's loaded with fentanyl. If you touch that, you're going to die. Much less consume it. They don't care. They're going to do it anyway. There was a guy in there who said, <clears throat> um, when you'd hear about somebody overdosing and dying, he would chase the dealer down because he wanted the good stuff. He wanted that stuff. Oh and God. he figured that whoever just overdosed didn't know what they were doing. But in his mind, he knew what he was doing. Wow. Perfect time. He, yeah, he and he would chase the That's dealers a, down. Okay. Chasing the dragon. Yep. You said, yeah, chasing the dragon. And I know what that is because I've, yeah, it's on a, the foil, right? Yeah, they're pulling that smoke in. But the idea, what you just said was they're looking for that perfect high. Yep. Mick Jagger told everybody a long time ago, can't get no satisfaction. Okay? Can't get there. I, I don't know how... I know he's full of Satan, but he said it. There isn't enough drugs in the world to satisfy the demands of our flesh. Not, Not enough in this world. That first one teases you and the rest of them never gets you there. You're, you're always trying yeah. to get back to that. You know, first, first um, some people who are insanely wealthy they get drugs brought to them every day, okay? And so they have a plenty of supply all the time. Well, what are the, what ends up happening to them? They're dead. Yeah. They're all dead, every one of them. And the cravings of the flesh are never satisfied. You never, 
you never get high and say after that there's no need me getting high ever again that was the best one ever i win i win it's never happened yeah and it and it's that way with alcohol it's that way with sex you know solemn i make a point to tell people especially guys solomon had a thousand women and if you think that finding that perfect woman is going to satisfy the demands of your flesh forever you are wrong that's why Solomon had a thousand, and probably if he'd lived another 40 years, he'd have found another thousand. But it never happened. He never got that satisfaction. And that's the, that is chasing the dragon. That is the devil Take using that to absolutely demolish your soul, your life, your family, your kids' lives, and this whole country. That's what happens. So... But God was telling me, Mike, sit here at this table and listen to these people talk. And you're going to learn from that. And you're going to, you're, you're going to, I'll use you, but I'm going to do it my terms, not yours. Okay? My terms. And so that's what he, that's what he did with me. That's what he's doing with you guys. And so you'll look back now at this. And there's more than one thing to learn from everything that happens. But you will look back now and say, I see now that God had to do it that way. It was the only right way to do it. It was the only thing. And I'm sure there's things about all this that you guys aren't telling us. And that's fine. We don't need to know. There are lessons to be learned that that will be between you and God alone to learn. Okay, But the idea is, that you're going to sit now in a church pew and instead of being the self-righteous church people you're the kind of church people that can invite somebody and say we got people just like us in our church and you know what people i know this people will go where is that church i want to go to that church because I still think there's some people out there that know that the answers are in church. They just don't know what church. And they get led into a wrong church. And they get their head messed up and bad things happen. But I think there's still people out there that would say, tell me where this church is. No, I just got that one guy came all the way down from West Virginia just to see me. Yeah. He had heard me talk about Roy so much, he said, I'm going to go meet this guy. And he did. That's awesome. Um, Shocked the devil out. <laughs> yeah. And, and couldn't happen soon enough, I say that. Yeah. Shocked the devil out of you. Let me, let, me, let me read Psalm 23 real quick. And then, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And then he said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, what is a rod used for in the Bible? Okay. Um, the staff and the rod. The staff pulls them in. The rod beats them in. Okay. So, I know. God's either going to use the hook on the end of the shepherd's staff to drag you in. Or, yeah, or he's going to use the rod on your backside to force you in because God understands the flesh. He understands this body that he made for us and he knows how weak it is. And he says to us, in Hebrews 12, one of my favorite places, it's about chastening, and it actually gives the proof of who is saved and who isn't. It's the one who lets God chasten them, just like a father is supposed to do to his child. God will chasten us, and sometimes the chastening is pretty hard. I've had it. Everybody's had it. But notice that our comfort comes from that. Now, why is that? God designed, it wasn't Dr. Spock who designed the brains of little children. It was God. S S Dr. Spock was this children's psychiatrist back in the early 60s and 70s. 
that that said, you know, whipping children, it's all wrong. You guys are doing, you're all messed up. You need to understand children. So let's do time out. Let's do this. None of it works. So these are the kids now who grew up that way that are now burning stuff down all over the country. Okay. But God knows, I'll give you an example. There was a school uh, in New York City and the liberal do-gooders who were running the school noticed that the kids were all pressed up against the fence in the playground. And they said, these kids don't want to feel like they're in prison. That's terrible. Let's remove the fence. So they took the fence down. They noticed that the kids were all huddled toward the middle of the playground. Okay? The lesson of that is children need barriers and their psychology, whether they verbally express it, their psychology knows, their, their minds and their hearts know that with limitations comes protection. Okay? So when he says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How I know that God is not done with me and he's not going to throw me away is that he still chastens me. And I respect the man who chastens me. I respected my parents. And if I showed disrespect to my parents, my parents let me have it. Okay. Do I, do I have to go see a therapist every week because my mom spanked me? No. No, I am thankful that she did that. Because had she not done that, I would not be sitting here today. I guarantee I'd not be sitting here today. And I'd either be dead or prison or whatever. But it's the rod of God and the fact that God did bring the guilt down on you of what you did. Um, the people who won't do well after 30 days of rehab are the people who didn't feel guilty about what they did. Did you see anybody like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you did. There They'll be right there that their uh, moms made them come. Court ordered. Court ordered. All of it. You know. And you guys was, signed it's, yourself it's, up. It's in to go back. Yeah. You yeah. signed yourself up, and that means I'm taking this seriously. I want to help, mm -hmm. um, but the people who won't receive any correction, they'll be back. Or they'll be dead, one of the two, or they'll, they'll be in jail, one of the two. And so it, it speaks well of you guys and what God has done in your life. Because could we say 10 years ago, this would have never happened? No, it would never happen. Okay? You'd have just let it run its course. Yeah. Okay? But God stepped in. God allowed it. God stepped in. And the devil may have used it to destroy you. But it didn't work. And there's a there's a theme in the Bible. It's what the Joseph's brothers tried to do to Joseph. They tried to kill him, and they decided against it. So they just sold him into slavery. But they were basically just getting rid of him because they hated him. But that very act was what brought about their salvation. You follow Joseph's life, and you see how Joseph ends up being the second most powerful human being on the planet. With all of the food of the world at his disposal, he can give it out as much as he wants to whoever he wants. And all of a sudden, his 11 brothers show up saying, we and our dad are starving to death. And Joseph bawling his eyes out. And he says to his brethren, remember what you did to me? And they're afraid that he's playing them and he's going to kill them. Yeah. They're scared to death he's going to kill them. And he said, you don't understand. What you meant to me for evil, God meant to you for good. Okay, So what's happened is that God has taken you guys and turned you into something you were never before. Okay? And that is superheroes on the right team. Okay? Because now you're going to you're going to see that sin with more zeal now than you ever have before. It made you mad. At some point you got angry at what you're going through and devil you might pull this on me again. You might weaken me again. But I'm here to tell you, you're not having me. You don't, you don't own me. Because if you did, you would have had me already. You don't own me. You don't own my wife. You don't own my kids. You don't own 
the, the things that are part of my life and our family. And devil, you don't own my future either. Amen. And you never will. And that'll, tr it'll let that zeal convert you to what you said you wanted to do. Help people. Okay? You've been through it. Again, none of us can sit here and say, bless God, we're going to meetings, we're never going to do this again. None of us can. I, so don't, don't go there. A long time ago, to say, oh, I've been, that, you know, that, that it can't ever happen again. Or, yeah. you know, it's not going to happen again. You know, um, I like to say it wouldn't, you know. But, uh, and, uh, if, if it happens again, um, deal with it the way you dealt with it this time. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to cover it up. Uh, you mentioned the A word, accountability. And... Um, you know, it's difficult when two people in the same marriage have drug addictions, but it can work, okay? Because days that you're strong, she won't be. Days she's strong, you won't be. And you will be able to help one another. We've worked up a plan. Good, good. Keep, that's why I was going to say, yeah. have, an, have an arrangement made that if one of you gets into it, the other one's not going to fly off the handle. You're going to say, okay, let's work through this. Let's work our plan. Uh, let's call Brother Mike and do this. Do the same thing over again. Do it again. And it's a, it's a, it's a plan that worked and it'll work again. I'm not going, I'm not going to give up on you guys. This group's not going to give up on you guys. Your church's not going to give up on you. God's definitely and God's definitely not. He never has. So, um, you know, Brian, the word that I told you on the phone when the first day you called me was, I'm proud of you. And I mean that. And Jesus Christ has a whole family of men and women that he's not ashamed to be called their friend. He's not ashamed of them. Everybody else might be, but he's not. And if you've got Jesus not ashamed of you, you've got it. Yes? I still, the program... I have been working with uh, 30 plus years. I still take it one day at a time. One day at a time. That's I it. Could That's be it. Honest here, I can say I didn't drink yesterday and so forth tonight. I have to tell you I ain't, ain't going to drink tomorrow and be honest about it. I can't. You haven't gone to sleep yet. Day's not over with. So, and it is. It, there's, there's a value to think that way. And I've, I've learned that, um, you know, God's told me in more ways than one and more times than one, Mike, if you think you're going to get out of this world being perfect, you're wrong. I won't let you do it because then you're not any good to anybody. So, again, you're going to find somebody. And you're going to start talking to them and you're going to say, you know what? We go to a church and in our church, they don't throw out drug addicts or drunks or drunks or pill poppers. Or pill poppers. <laughs> okay. And they're going to go, where is this church? And you're going to say, well, some of the things that we've talked about are online. You need to listen to them and you have no idea how God's going to use that. Okay. Even if you personally don't have the ability or God doesn't bring about the situation where you're going to work with somebody. Just the fact that you let us talk about it tonight yeah. and it's being recorded and I'm going to get it out there. And at some point you're going to say to somebody, I go to a church and this is how they deal with drunks and drug addicts and every other kind of people. It's the real deal because people are looking for it. Let's go to prayer. Father, we love you. And um, Lord, we, we would say we are sorry again, as I do. Lord, I, I tell you, not every day, but almost every day, 
how sorry I am for things that I did when I was 14 years old. God, that I'm not over yet. I am sorry. I'm sorry that I ever hurt you. I'm sorry that I ever hurt anybody in my life. And I don't ever want to hurt anybody else ever again. But I don't have control over that. You do. So, Father, I, I beg for your mercy. I thank you, Father, for the ability for people to come and be honest. And, God, we don't have to know everything. But just the honesty of of opening up to you and opening up to ourselves to say this is who I am we can tell the world to take it or leave it but this is who we are and father you've put it in us to want something better so father we ask for your help for that because we don't have it in us as we go to bed tonight help us to say thank you for giving us another day clean and sober Tomorrow will be a new day, as Roy said, and we don't have that hope. We don't have that promise that we'll be clean and sober all day tomorrow. So we'll just have to take tomorrow as it comes. And Father, remind us to call you there for us, and you're not going to let us go because we'll need help. The devil's planning his next trap. He's planning his next move. He's planning his next vexation. We don't know what he's going to do, where he's going to turn up, but we just know that he is. So, Father, we pray, God, that you would give us the strength and give us the help, dear God, so that he doesn't win. You do. Thank you for conquering us. Thank you for uh, taking a rod to us. That gives us comfort to know that we are your sons. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.